I have a cat. What's up? Milo's here. Sorry folks, no Sabrina today. She is dealing with all kinds of like prior to Christmas school stuff, break stuff, um, all kinds of other crap. Plus it's also, it's snowing. So the kids are super excited, uh, but they also won't go outside. So she is really having to referee what's going on. And I was hoping, I was hoping, but you know, you get what you get. Okay. Uh, I don't know where I start here. Oh, I know where we start. We start with the wrist check. Okay. Wrist check. I have, I have a number of things that are sitting in my project drawers that I've never, I haven't had time to get to in a long time, but I finally made time last weekend to work on this one. 6139, 6005. Uh, this one is, whew, gosh, I should remember, but I don't. Where is it? There we go. Oh, yes. August 1973. This one was real interesting. At the time that I picked this up, which was a very long time ago now, this was... People turned their noses up at these. I, I remember posting about this one a long time ago and people were like, yeah, you know, you should just throw that insert away. You know, it's too bad. It's so worn. Also, it didn't help that the dial loom and hand loom was damaged. But now that I have, so that's one of the reasons why they sat for so long is because the dial loom and hand loom was damaged. But with uh, my Revital loom, I was able to take it back to white. The only, I mean, this super smooth ghosting the only time I've ever seen anything like this was when the owner's father worked in a chemical factory. And that might be what this is. The And the loom was like, I don't know, it was gray? I'm not really, it, it was funky. And it has some sort of stardust and peppering on the dial. And so I just left it alone because I didn't really feel like doing anything to the loom. And I had a feeling that at some point maybe I'd find a way to cure damaged loom and because the hand metal and the reflecting points of the of the markers is so nice i just left it and then i found it again and i said well you know i think it's time wait it ain't thursday it's friday today is Friday the 11th, right? Whoops. I messed up. There's Friday. Today's the 11th, I think. There we go. Now we're better. Isn't that pretty, though? It really is unusual to see this kind of that kind of super smooth wear. That's the original crystal too. It's the original type too. Isn't that wild? Pretty nice watch. This is a, a Jonathan Koch East Tech straight H link. The best of the best. He uh, he made these. Um, he replicated them off of a Stellux H link, which is why it has the the stronger curve and the thicker sections. I sure wish, I sure wish we had found out who made these for him. I mean, we got the crystals, thank God, but these bracelets, man, they're just so beautiful. They were so nicely made. Anyway, that's what's on today's wrist. Hi, Milo. What's going on? Look, there's Milo. Biggie, biggie, biggie. Peter Campbell. Wait, what? Sorry, I'm still getting myself together. The first thing was from Troy Nacello, actually. Please look at this link. I included a couple of pics, but check out the others at the posting. Have you ever seen this before? It's a first for me. A bit too pricey, but so bizarre yet awesome. If you can, please feature this on Mail Call this Friday. It would make my week. Well, Troy, I hope we're making your week. So here's a picture of what he's talking about.
those are pretty cool. Um, they always reminded me of the Sentinels or Sentries or whatever they were called in uh, Matrix, the big sort of like killer robots that would come up with all the tentacles. I remember the first time I ever saw one of those in the flesh, we were walking around downtown in our old town and uh, the jewelers down there had one. They, they always have a selection of watches and they had some Seiko stuff there and I saw it and I was like, I didn't quite know what to think about it. It was pretty wacky. It reminded me also at the time of maybe something you'd see. I think there was a like a Porsche design watch that kind of had that same look. Um, they're pretty neat. I've never seen one personally. Uh, I, I do remember running across one once online and it was cheap and I didn't buy it. And I'm like, I'm kind of annoyed because they're really, they really are unique. Poor Milo. God, I've got to give you a bath. Jeez, you're dirty. Poor Milo. Uh, but they're super cool, especially with their titanium. But yeah, they're getting to be a lot of money these days. Peter Campbell. The prices of the old Seamasters have really increased also. Well, you know, that's good to hear. It never made sense to me how little they go for. I mean, vintage Omega, I mean, hell, modern Omega, Omega's really nice. Vintage Omega is really nice. Equally as nice. In fact, I would say in many cases it's nicer than equivalent Rolex at the time. I mean, you can get things like the, you know, the, the 550 movements, 560 movements, and they've got all kinds of fine adjust things, a swan neck regulator. They're beautifully jeweled. They have that gorgeous rose gold colored plating on on everything and just oh, vintage omega is just it's ridiculous how how what a value it is and they should be worth more they're freaking cool they're really really nice paul Steele. i agree with the watchwinder and kinetic movements however uh, in the sense that I think he's talking about talking about how watch winders don't work for winding a kinetic Seiko. However, I found that using my, my GPS and mounting the watch to my dog's collar, I can take her for a walk or a run and it gets wound up pretty consistently. I also found that while I was at sea, a room fan that turned the fan guard both circumferentially and sweeping, mounting the watch to the fan guard also exercised the watch. Uh, when I was on duty enough to wind it up, that's crazy. You guys have seen it. You've, you've got fans and they've got veins that go in different directions and they turn and then they're also going back and forth. That's, that is really thinking outside the box. When you were at sea, were you in the Navy or do you just s sail a lot? Man, if I lived close to the ocean, and didn't have to worry about anything. I'd be out on the boat with my Milo. He wants to be a ship's cat. Don't you? Don't you want to be a ship's cat? God, I've got to give you a bath. Sebastian rubbed something on his head. Ugh. Anyway, that's extremely clever to do, talking about the, uh, talking about how to wind up those kinetics. Because that sounds like that would be gentle enough that it would also not be a danger to the winding mechanism. Nacho Valenti. What a nice surprise to see you again together in the mail call. Welcome back, Sabrina. Wish you were here today, but, you know, she just, there's lots going on right now. Lots going on. Any case, I have a question for the next week. I have a good friend of mine bought a Steinhardt GMT 39 millimeter with the Jubilee bracelet a few weeks ago. He's very happy with the quality of the watch, movement, bracelet, etc. And I wanted to know your, uh, your always valuable opinion. Sometimes valuable, but thank you. Thanks in advance and also for your excellent videos. I should put more work into them. Um, Steinhardt to me has always been... It always seemed like very decent quality. Um, obviously, much of what they do is, you know, is homage stuff. They tend to do a lot of, like, things that are almost, that look kind of Rolexy. They take a lot of uh, cues from there. But their their quality is it's fine. And actually, at a certain point, I was really, really interested in a Steinhardt 39 millimeter, But I never really thought about it. They have, all the ones I've seen have, you know, their standard ETA movements. Um, but the quality was fine. I never had a problem with them. They've got good machining and everything else like that. I think the only, the only homage 
that I've seen that is as nice or nicer is, oh God, I forget the name. Who is that guy? And he was making Rolex, not knockoffs, but they were real borderline knockoffs. Um, and then it turns out that he was actually making fake Rolexes, like everything down to like, like inserts were being made in the UK. He was down in Arizona. What was the name of it? His symbol was like a flower? Gosh, I can't remember. But I have seen one of those and their quality was, was nice. Whatever, whatever else you want to say about that gentleman, his quality was good. Um, Class Redin, Redin, R-E, Redin. Question from mail call, hi, Spencer and Sabrina. I bought a nice 6138-8010 in nice original condition with the original bracelet. God, that's, that's hard to do. I rarely see them and I've never seen you handle one. Have you ever owned one and why are they so rare? Okay, yes, I've handled one. Um, I've never owned one. What these are is the baby panda. It's the 6138, um, what the heck was that? 6138s, the JDM speed timer versions. Those particular ones, for whatever reason, those baby pandas, they are, they're super expensive. They're quite rare. Uh, I haven't seen one for sale in a very long time. The only one I've ever serviced, belonged to Eric Strickland, uh, who's a great, great collector. He's on Instagram at um, uh, Eric K. Strickland. At, and I think that's his thing, but they're cool. I have a case for one. I mean, that's something, right? It's a beat up empty case with a worn tacky ring in, uh, in it. Uh, I mean, I could in theory build a watch with it, like a regular panda dial, a regular 6138 panda dial, mm, fits right in. But the thing with those JDM ones, man, they're just, I don't know, they're really, really, really crazy sought after and people pay crazy money for them. And I've never really been quite sure why. They're, they're cool. They're small though. Uh, they're, they're definitely, definitely teenier. Um, but guys love them and they pay a lot of money. Those bracelets are super cool and those are those are worth a lot too. What? What is your problem? What is your problem? I don't know, maybe I should do something with that case. I don't think I'll ever own one of the originals. Um, super Cruise, hey Super Cruise, how are you? What? He's doing this. Okay. Hi, Spencer. It's been a while since I submitted a question, but here we go. In servicing some early 6139A cal movements, what are your thoughts on sweep hand reset calibration via the hammer? I always take a conservative approach and do not like a ton of tension on the hammer reset spring, uh, but removing tension sometimes leads to the sweep, needing two or three pushes of the reset button in some instances to get the sweep to reset to zero at certain positions on the dial. Is this normal? Um, it depends. You can also have problems if it doesn't really cleanly want to snap back with a lesser amount of force. Uh, it might be too that your operating levers are not set correctly. It's one of the big things. If you look in the service manual, the operating levers have to have a very specific distance away from the clutch portion, like the, the clutch plates. They have to be, they can't be too far and they can't be too far in. Um, they have to be, it's, it's the same amount and it's quite a small amount and that can have an effect on basically not disengaging the clutch enough and then it can, the, the sweep can drag when, it, when you pull it back. So that's something that I would definitely check. Um, I think if, if you don't have any problems with that and the reset is still slow, I don't know. I mean, because those things, when when that thing's disengaged, there should be no resistance. It should just go. Quick. The only other thing it might be is are the heart wheels in good shape? Heart uh, the cams are. Is your hammer in good shape? Is there something that's catching, that's increasing friction? Um, I don't know. What? It's not my fault that you have stuff on your head. Sorry, I keep picking the things on his head. Um, I swear to God, I will give you a bath tomorrow. 
Milo loves the shower. You can actually pick him up and take him into the shower with you, and he just sits there in your arms, and you can scrub him off. I'll do that tomorrow for you. So that's the first things I would check those. I would get out your manual and look and make sure that those operating levers are where they're supposed to be. Um, okay. I lubricate, this is the same person. I lubricate the hammer mating surfaces with a bit of 9010. I usually like to go a little thicker than that. 9010 is like for balanced pinions and really fine things. I go, I, I actually have had pretty good luck using a tiny amount of 94110 because it stays put and it doesn't move around and it, um, it, it, it is a little slicker. You might try that. Also, um, I found that using a little bit of S4 on, on that reset spring that interacts with the hammer, um, that makes it a little slicker. Um, and also that too, it stays in place. And those, between those two things, I'm going to get some pretty good, good things on it here. Uh, you can increase the spring tension to improve the snap. Yes. Yes. You could use something a little heavier, like I just subscribed, uh, said to you. I know the A caliber movements do not have an eccentric screw to modify the angle of the mating surfaces of the hammer to the heart cams. I really do not want to go in and start filing hammer surfaces. It's, yeah, but we'll do that if that's the solution. Do you think the heart cams wear over time? Any advice here is appreciated. I always say hands resetting to zero is ultimately what you're looking for. Yes, you want those hands, you want those hands going straight up, straight up to zero. Um, why don't we, I can't remember seeing cam wheels with severe wear. Usually what I see is I'm going to see uneven wear on the hammer faces, but also I'm going to see things like, oh, if you have a lot of resets, you have to look at the upper, you know, the upper bushing for the minute recorder wheel, because those things, they can get pushed out. And if you look at it, you can see a dimple on one side with those get pushed. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's break um, and I'll get out my service manual and I'll get some other stuff and we'll just talk about it real quick. Okay. Here's our handy dandy service model service book. It's nice because it gives you all your lubrications and everything that you need. Breaks it all down. You can see all the bits, how it's assembled, how these things work. This is the critical thing right here. So here is, if you go, that, that's one of the reasons why this Manual is so important, operational chronograph mechanism. And you can actually see right here how all this stuff works and the clutch ring, how everything works like this, give you a real idea of how to deal with it. It has, you get very specific information about how to adjust the levers. Where is that? God, this is a great book. Accenture, aha, here it is. Right there. So you have your clearance. It shows the clearances. You've got to you've got to have this using this eccentric pier, pin here. You adjust to make sure that these are just like that because you want to make sure that you have everything in and that it's actually disengaging the clutch correctly. That's what you need to do. That's the first thing that I would check. The next thing I would look for again is. Uh, I've been thinking I would have dug this out. Well, you can't really see it right here. Okay, I would look. This is your spring that catches the hammer. There's the hammer with that post right there. If you look, look at the underside of the chronograph bridge, look at that bushing right there and see if it's dimpled out, if it's pushed out to one side of the hole, instead of being nice and round, in fact, has been squished out like this. Because what that'll do, if that gets pushed a lot sideways, it'll change the clearances between these faces right here. And then if you change those clearances, then all of a sudden you're, you're going to get kind of wackiness where it doesn't set correctly when it resets. So that's one of the first things. And that's relatively easy to deal with. You just, um, 
You can just close up the hole a little bit just on a with a staking press. It's not that hard. Or you can, if you really don't want to feel like doing that, you can clean it up a little bit. You can push out this bushing and turn it 180 degrees. And then you've got a clean face to work with. That's a cheap thing to do. I really don't like having to go in back and forth and 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 filing these down because it's it's so easy to create more drag so that's the first things i check that is the first things that i check i love these things i just love these manuals i should put them by my bed and read them before bedtime but then i'd never sleep because it's so awesome okay Hi Spencer, I am SUN023. It is a different color than your SO, SUN019. I really like the watch and the second hand hits the markers perfectly on my example. Um, quibbles, I don't like the short hands. No, it never occurred to me that the hands were short. When I think short hands, I think of Arnie hands. I know they are short because of the raised markers, but I would really li have liked longer hands. The 5M85 movement is very robust and probably even better built than the 7C46. From my limited perspective, when you disassemble yours, please let me know what you think. Uh, okay, I wasn't really planning on ripping it apart. I did have to clean it. I was going to take the shroud off and stuff like that. I wasn't going to go near the movement. I like the kinetic technology, but like you, I find it annoying when it starts to die. I also find the watch too large. Um, I dented the shroud at the four o'clock on mine. Some sh say the shroud is aluminum on these. I thought they were stainless. Uh, I'll have to check. I believe they're stainless. Um, and it prevented the bezel from turning. I had to remove the shroud and slightly bend it back so the bezel would function properly. I like the recessed crystal and the loom. I like the techno techno technical aspect of the charging technology. I have so many other watches and that makes keeping this watch charged almost impossible. Mine is used as a true tool watch and it is worn when I know there's a high probability of damage occurring. I do the same thing, it's my garage watch, actually. Um, uh, oh, I wish the watch was 41 millimeters, had longer hands and a manual winding option. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be cool if you had a way to manually charge that thing? Wouldn't that be wild? You turn the thing, you turn the crown, in a winding position and it spins the rotor and charges the battery right then and there. And if you had a charging indicator, boy, and if you had a, I mean, that would be a huge extra mass of technology, but boy, it would sure make using that thing a lot nicer. I wonder how you could do that. How could you add manual winding to a kinetic watch? Boy, that would really be, I don't know. I don't know why. He's all amped up because um, Amazon keeps coming. Um, my in-laws sent Christmas presents. Kids are going ape. Uh, let's see. Please make a video when you disassemble your your example. Thank you. Uh, if if I ever get around to cleaning it and pulling it apart, I certainly will. Here is from Nurk. Hi, Spencer. I have a question regarding my SKX. Maybe you can help me out. I've owned it for about two, three years now, and it's never let me down. The bezel action has always been a bit tight, unlike the one on my turtle, which moves buttery smooth. However, over time, I realized the bezel was so hard to turn that I thought I'd look and pop the bezel off. My initial thought was that the clicky ring was the culprit, so I removed it. I popped the bezel back on and tried to turn without clicks, still stiff. So I popped off the bezel again, removed the gasket to see if this was causing me trouble. Turns out that it was very easy to turn without the gasket. I then went online to buy replacement gaskets, which apparently fit better than the original, and repeated the procedure with a new one. The bezel was still stuck, and yes, I made sure to grease it with silicone grease before the installment. Have you had a similar experience with modern Seiko? Um, the biggest consistent thing I have to look for when you were dropping on those those rotating bezels, you have to make sure that the that the O-ring gasket stays out, that it stays inside the the shelter, inside the groove of that bezel. Because if it's kind of loosey goosey, it's going to get pulled out. And then when you snap it in place, you have a loop of the stuff, a loop of the gasket caught between the case and the ring. So 
way I deal with that whenever I'm going to put one in, um, I take it and I go, burp, 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 and I stretch it out a little bit. Now, it may seem like it's a little big, it's going to start shrinking down again, but you go, burp, 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 and you get a little bigger, and you tuck it into that groove, and then it's going to hold in there, and then snap it in. It should be instantly smooth. If it's not instantly smooth, there's a problem. Either it's not snapped on all the way, or that gasket got pinched. So that's the thing that I check. It, believe me, it happens to me, but that's how I cure it. Intizamable. Uh, this was a note not to me, but to WR Watches. WR Watches, please manufacture also the 6105-8110 with correct case dimensions, thanks. Whew, man, if they produced a 6105 Willard case, correct case with the correct dimensions man that would be something they have a bronze one i've seen the bronze one i hate the dial though and the logo is like this weird curvy thing man but if they got if they got the aha because if they got the case dimensions right i mean there's just such elegant perfection in these cases they're so beautiful and elegant, and there's nothing in the world that looks like this. It's one of the true marks of excellence of Seiko's design, that it is so beautiful and ergonomically perfect, and, the, and, and it's so unique. No one's ever done anything like this. It's, it's one of the most beautiful watch designs I've ever seen, one of the most beautiful watch cases that ever were. It's beautiful. If, and if, if they could do it, and make it right so that all the compound curves are correct. Oh, man, that'd be beauty. I mean, they're just so beautiful. It's such a beautiful watch. So, WR Watches, if you are watching, please do make one. They wrote me, by the way. Um, they wrote me last week because some of you may remember I did a review. I think the first review of the of their 6105 Slim Case homage. Um, and as a result of my review, apparently, uh, they immediately started selling out of that model. They sold out repeatedly over and over and over again. It was this huge spike of business for them. Well, they have a new automatic tuna. It's sort of green looking. Um, and they also, they, as an option, they, they can pre-age it, but they wrote me and they were like, Hey, we want to have you, you know, um, review one of these, uh, and uh, I said, well, oh, okay, send me that. And I'd love to see one of the 62 MAS ones you have too. And I haven't heard anything back. So I don't think they're going to send me anything. Jim Canataro. Mail call question. Can you take a guess as to why so many bullhead Seikos and citizens come out of Central and South America? The only thing I can think of is that they like to buy them because of the significant bulls have in Latin culture. What significance do bulls have in Latin culture? I don't know the answer to that. I've, I've never heard of that. I only know it in terms of um, bullfighting. This is a wild guess, but it was the only thing that came to mind. Thanks as always. I don't know. Central and South America are pretty serious mysteries to me, uh, especially back then. I mean, my knowledge of that part of the world at that time is pretty limited. Um, the only piece of the only piece I can bring to bear on that is that I do know brown bullheads were imported by the palletful to the United States. Tons and tons and tons of them. I, I think for every I've only seen it four or five or six black black horse black um, bullheads. All the rest have been brown, um, and I think maybe that was to do with the fashion at the time, because browns and golds were very big in the 70s. Maybe that was it. Most of the black ones that I see are in, they're typically pretty worked, uh, pretty beaten up, and gnarly looking. Whereas, I mean, there's so many brown bull heads that even today you can still find good original untouched conditions on them. I know there's a lot of Seikos in Central and South America. One of our regular commenters here, um, Mr. Pedroni, uh, he is in Brazil and he has a ton of Seikos and he's still buying them. 
they're down there. I know they had, there were service, several service centers down in Central and South America. I wish I knew more. I'm sorry. Ah, Maxius. Curious on your thoughts on using a 7A movement in a serious use tool watch. Robustness say the 7A28 7040 or 7A38 with 7070 with the rotating bezel. Well, both of those models were military issued, um, which I'm sure you knew, uh, but they were both military issued uh, watches, um, depending, I mean, not widely distributed, but in South Africa they used them. Um, obviously, the 7A28 non rotating bezel is the RAF Gen 1, and those were definitely used in, you know, bonking around in airplanes and stuff. 7A chronograph movements are superlative. They are insanely overbuilt. They were Seiko proving to the world what they could do. It was the very first analog quartz chronograph, and they just, they're stupidly overbuilt. Like, you can make chronographs, and Seiko does, you can make quartz movements completely out of plastic. And a lot of the, a lot of the modern ones, they are. They're completely plastic. The 7As were all metal trains. There were four separate gear trains. Each gear train had its own coil and step motor. Uh, it was fly-by-wire technology. Uh, I, and they have 15 jewels. 15 jewels in a quartz watch. They're un... Just with regular wear, they're unkillable. There's nothing you can do to kill one. Period. I've, I've never... I've never seen one wear out. I saw one... I've probably seen actually a couple where the, the, the sort of the canyon pinion setup was worn, but that's just, you know, you put in a new center wheel. It's one of the ones where you have the basically sort of the, the canyon pinion center wheel thing and you have a, the, the, the gear section just sort of snaps on and the friction is provided by the fingers of that gear snapping into place. Um, other than that, no. What'll kill a 7A is water is the worst. Water gets in, those things, they rust like crazy, and they're really tightly built. So there's, when water gets in, capillary action surface tension will suck the water right in, and boy, it'll just destroy a movement. That and a battery leak. So, if you have one of these watches, and it's freshly rebuilt, fully serviced, and the case is rebuilt with all new seals, it should be fine. One of the videos I have, on my channel is a guy who had a 7A28-7049, um, and he was a dive instructor in the ocean, and he lost his watch one year diving, and one of his students found it the following year, and it was still running. I serviced that watch, and it was, it was in pretty good shape. So as long as you've got a good silver oxide battery, and it's been recently serviced, and it has all new correct seals, you should be able to beat the ever-living hell out of it and have no problems. Amir Beck. Um, he was happy with the video. This is not related to the 7002, but for vintage Seikos in general, do you know if caseback scratches affect the value? I have a 6309-7040 I got from my father today, and it's perfect with white loom, but there are a few scratches on the case back, none deep, but they're pretty visible. I enjoy the watch, not for the value, but it's an almost perfect piece with just that one problem that makes me curious. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's people call them tool marks. Um, I guess well, let's let's break. I, I I'll, I'll dig out some case backs and let's yeah. Start. Tool marks, tool marks on case backs. It's kind of a I don't know, it's kind of a problem. You can, it depends what level we're talking. If it's, if it's relatively minor, just little teeny tiny handling scratches, you know, something, something like this. That's not bad. That's pretty decent. It has a couple little tool marks in there. Most people wouldn't really care about that much. But then you get to things like this. Look at that. Somebody who was definitely in this thing was just... They didn't care. And they just wanted it off. This came from um, Ramon, the watch collector, down in Manila. 6139-6002. Something like this, yeah, that's gnarly. But 
with, you know, with a correct, you know, a jeweler's lathe, if you can spin this, you can clean this up a lot. A lot of times when people do clean these up, they look bad because they go too far. They, they really grind it down and then they also spin this. So it has these sort of circular brushing marks here. It's not supposed to look like that ever. When they were brand new, they were flat like this. That's what they looked like. But one can with care do it. Yeah, like that's not bad. Look, that one's pretty decent. Put the case back. And this one's a little hacked up too. That's a little hacked up, but one could clean it up. But you know, you've got your father's watch and that's, that's awesome. I like this one too. Look at that, it's too bad. Little hits, but if I worked this one down, I could make that better. This is really late. Look at that. This is a 6005 from 1988. July 88. It's really, really late. They weren't even being sold anymore by that point, I don't think. I could be wrong. Yeah, but it depends how bad the tool marks are. You can, with care, take care of it, or you can just leave it. You know, it's one of those things. There's abuse, and then there's questionable servicing. All right. Okay. This is from Synth Frost talking about my super modded 7002 that I figured out how to put um, a 6R15 movement in by modifying the, um, the, the date wheel guard to be able to hold a 7002 date wheel in place because the 6R15 has a either crown at three or crown at 345. Whereas the 7002 is crown at four. You have to have a, a date wheel at four, otherwise it just doesn't work right. Um, as much as I enjoy an all original piece, I have to say it's some amazing work to get a 6R15 in that. Yeah, you know, if, if, if it was a complete watch, like if the original movement had not been physically, physically destroyed by the person who had the watch before me, I would have just serviced it. I, in fact, I considered putting a 7002 movement back into it and I, I may yet, I have 7002 movements, but it was a fun challenge to see if that could be done. And I, and I did it. Um, I may, if the, I have the watch, oh gosh, the, Sarai's out walking, walking the baby today. God, it's freezing cold and it's snowing. Well, good for her. Um, it's funny, I was talking to her husband uh, next door and he, he told me that his wife, who's a, a very nice, peppy, vivacious person, that she uh, has five older brothers. Can you imagine marrying a girl who has five older brothers? Well, they seem happy. Um, what was I gonna say? I have that 7002. I have it on the website for sale simply because I don't know that I will wear it that much. Time will tell. But if for some reason it doesn't sell as it is, even though it's super cool as it is, I, I might consider putting a 7002 back into it to make it original again. But I don't feel too bad about modif you know, hot riding that because the original movement was destroyed. And the nice thing about the 7X series, 7000s, 7005, 7006, 7009, 7S, 4R, 6R, they're all the same, more or less. And so I can put, I can put a 7002 dial, I can drop it directly onto a 6R movement. It's like the only modification I had to do was to get it so that the dial plate held that the 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 wheel down because the differences in material 6r date wheel is plastic and it's thick um 7000 date wheel is metal and it's quite thin and so the wheel kept coming up so i had to basically i had to make a jig to hold the calendar guard so i could tab down some of the edges just ever so slightly to hold that ring in place it was actually a lot simpler than i thought it was going to be what Andrew W. Hi, Spencer. It looks like Seiko is bringing back King Seiko after 46 years. I know. I saw it just the other day. They're reusing the 449990, except it doesn't use the 44 movement, um, and calling it the SJE083. The original is one of my favorite King Seiko models. I agree. Predictably, the new one is bigger and more expensive. 39 millimeters, $4,000. It's an interesting movement in it, though, the 6L35, as opposed to the 6R35. What are your 
thoughts on this, and do you think it might push the values of vintage KS models up? They are still bargains at the moment. It never made sense to me why those vintage King Seiko models were so cheap. Like, $300. Like, this year. It blows my mind. It makes no sense to me why, they're, why a King Seiko is so cheap. Um, I think perhaps because people thought that King Seiko was one step down from Grand Seiko, whereas it was, it was made to be roughly equal. I mean, Grand Seiko went up, but King Seikos are absolutely no, they're not, they're no slouch at all. And the fact that they're so cheap is mind blowing. It's mind blowing that they're so inexpensive. They should be a lot more money. They're great watches. I mean, they're smaller. They're like 36, 37 millimeters, something like that, but beautiful Zeratsu case finishing and gorgeous dials. They're really nice. $4,000 though. And of course it's a limited edition. <clears throat> Spencer Braithwaite. Spencer, do you know, what do you know about a Pulsar Y1126019? Uh, let me put a picture of one of those in. Okay, it is recording. Um, I have one from 1985, and it's like a Seiko Greatest Hits collection, dial in hand similar to a 7548 SKX. Case is 38 millimeters and looks like a blend of a 7548-2205 Lady Diver and 6105-8110 undercut mid case. Bezel is similar to, to an SKX, unidirectional with one leaf spring. Movement has no trimmer, but it's all metal and jeweled. A teacher at my school gifted one to me. Wow. And I was able to clean it up and get it running nicely. Curious if you can give any insight on these. They seem to be somewhat unappreciated. Oh, they're more than unappreciated. Um, most people don't even know about them. Uh, but also, they're, they're very rarely seen. I don't think people kept them. Uh, I'm sure they sold a lot of them. I think a lot of them ended up in landfills. They weren't really preserved, which is too bad because they are cool. Uh, they're definitely cool. There's, in fact, there's a number of very cool Pulsar models of that time that are that are out here. Um, so the new, hang on a second. Oh right, right, right. So I mean, there are there's some cool Pulsars. There's a doing some research. There's a Pulsar that's a Y five one three six zero one nine, right? And the Y5136019, it's crazy. If you look at that one, it's it's the Seiko bottle cap, but like from 30 years ago. Literally, it has, it looks like the bottle cap. The bottle cap is a model that came out, I think, last year. S, uh, SPRC 61, 63, 65, 67. But they're called the bottle caps, and they're, they're cool. They're slightly too big. They should be slightly smaller, but it's like, it's... And again, nobody thinks about these early bottle cap pulsars at all. Y5136019. The one he's talking about is Pulsar Y112-6019. They're super cool. If my memory is correct, those use, they, they flat out use the 6309 crown, 7548 crown. Literally, it's the same crown. Um, and they're beautifully made. Beautifully made. Totally worth picking up. Hard to find those pulsars, though, man. I just did a search after your question. There's almost nothing out there, but I'm going to start looking. Okay, going back to talking about the 7002 um, that I modified, pre and mystery. I find it hilarious to modify the date wheel components. How come how someone hasn't made a new date wheel with different printing positions is beyond me, because 7002s have not been worth much of anything for a very long time. No one made any parts for them because no one would buy them. It would be a waste of effort, um, which is unfortunate. Perhaps that might change, but, you know, I agree. That if, if one could, I mean, and in fact, date wheels at four exist. We know that because WR Watches makes their 6105 with their date wheel as with the crown at four. So they definitely exist. If I could get my hands on some of the parts that they use, Absolutely. The one thing, though, is that the 7002 uses a metal disc, not a plastic one. So you would need to make that 
you'd have to deal with it being a different color or make it in like a gray silver to have it look the same. Um, so that's, that's one of the big issues. But yeah, if they could take that and make a ring that was crowned at four that had sort of a grayish look to it, absolutely. But it's only now really that the 7002s are starting to, you know, they're starting to get to the point of, um, well, are you sitting on a watch? He's sitting on many watches. 7002s are only really starting to pick up now, despite all my work trying to push them. Okay, RG. Hi, s and I wish the other S was here, but she's not. Um, a few questions for this Friday. One, I heard one high horology watch reviewer on YouTube say unidirectional rotor is more efficient than bidirectional. How so, if true? It's, there is, no, absolutely no way. That's absolutely not the case. When you have a unidirectional rotor, that's because you're using all of the, you're using the, the Swiss style with the, um, with the reversing wheels and all this kind of stuff. There's just, th that doesn't make any sense. Rolex doesn't use unidirectional, they use bidirectional. Uh, they don't use uh, the magic lever, the Paul lever that Seiko uses, but they, it goes both directions. There's no planet that I can think of that has where unidirectional would be more efficient than, um, than bidirectional. I mean, cause bidirectional, you know, unidirectional 50% of your movement direction isn't doing anything. Whereas on bidirectional, every time you move, no matter which way it's going, it's winding. That's nonsense. I don't know who said that, but that's silly. Um, how so if true, it's not true. I always thought it was the other way around. It is. Um, however, it seems that some high-end Swiss watches indeed utilize unidirectional rotors. So what? Um, R Rolex doesn't. So, you know, if Rolex doesn't do it, then there you go. Two, do Seiko movements, vintage or contemporary, use the Bruget overcoil hairspring or other tech to ensure the iso isynchronism? Okay, so isynchronism, for those of you who don't know, in horology, you want to have a watch maintain its accuracy at multiple power levels so that you don't say it runs great when it's at full power and it's completely accurate, but then as the mainspring gets drained, then it's not supplying as much power and you start getting a rise or you get a, a low. You don't want that. You want it to maintain its positional accuracy in multiple stages of, of power. I think Seiko most recently started using a Bruget overcoil in some of their super high-end watches, but I don't, I mean, that's really, that's a Swiss, Swiss thing. Um, I mean, I mostly associate that with, with Rolex and their, um, you know, and their free sprung balances. Uh, that's like a pocket watch thing. It's, it's high tech. That's, that, that's old school high-end stuff. I'm not aware of Seiko ever doing that. Um, Let's see. Three, what is currently on your watch wish list? What's your grail watch? Six, two, one, five, seven thousand. I think if, if I found one of those for a price that I could talk the misses into, I would certainly... I would certainly, certainly consider picking that up because I think that would be pretty cool. I love divers. Um, I really love the 6215 movements. In fact, I, I prefer 6215, 6216, 6218s, 6217 even. I prefer those to the 6159 high beats. They're slower, they're chuggier, but they're, they're, they, can, they have nice big balances with excellent positional accuracy and in good shape they have really high sustained amplitude and they just they're just really sweet they were just they're sweet movements the 6216s 6218s 6215 they're just they're great movements they're great movements and they're 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 unheralded they should be getting more but that's what I that's what I do but they they made them for such a short time and they're so expensive if you can find them but yeah, if I could get a 6215-7000 with the countdown bezel, that's Milo. What are you doing? He just spreads out. He just lets it all hang out. And everything that's in the way eventually just gets pushed off. Um, 
Okay, four. How's the NG project going? It's not going anywhere. Um, I've done a little bit of work. The problem is, is that, uh, well, it's not really a problem. Sebastian, he's four and he loves cars and he loves being in the garage and loves being with me. And those are all good things, but he makes it more or less impossible to do almost anything because uh, he has to engage with you 100% the whole time. So you have to be with him. Also, there are a lot of the things that I need to do he can't help me with. So when we're out there, I can't be doing anything with him uh, because he's trying to do something else or he's excited about something else and it doesn't work. Also, I'm working with big tools and welders and cutters and stuff like that because I'm dealing with the body right now and I'm just, I'm worried about him being injured. So, I do things every now and then, little things, but usually after he's gone to sleep, uh, and I'm saving it. I'm hoping for when we get to next summer, he's going to be a little more plugged in and we're going to do more stuff. I mean, he he knows that the MG is his car. I mean, he's going to, you know, me growing up, my dad had a 1958 Jaguar. It's a piece of garbage. When he bought it, it was just unbelievable junk. And we worked on it consistently. He and I worked together on it. I was supposed to be able to drive that car to my senior prom. Uh, that absolutely did not happen. Um, it, it didn't run for decades after that. But my hope is to be able to do for Sebastian what my dad was not able to do for whatever reason. And that, you know, Sebastian's going to be able to, you know, drive that thing to high school, which is about a mile and a half away, and, you know, have his his badass, badass car. So it's going to happen, just not right now. Aaron Costello, last question. Hey, man, I'm always so glad to hear from you. I'm always so glad to hear from you. I'm just glad you're sticking with me, and you're, you're one of the last people from the old, old days that I still speak to regularly. You're just, you're a great guy, and I always appreciate seeing you. The seven A's are so awesome. I just got my grail directly from Japan two weeks ago. A titanium 7A38-7030. Man, I love JDM titanium Seikos. They're really cool. Congratulations. That is awesome. So I'm going to then close with a picture of a model like what Aaron Costello got. And he just knocked off more stuff. Why are you doing that? Um, and we'll close with a picture of that. And that's about it. Come here. Come here. Oh, look at Mr. Mario. Oh, are you a happy cat? Okay, thanks, folks. That's the end of the Friday. Say goodbye, Milo.